everyone. Thank you for coming to the Speedway Public Library. Um, today, we would like to give a warm welcome to Mr. Donald Davidson. He knows what he's talking about. I'll hand it over to him. All right. Him. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is so flattering, and, and uh, I know that um, when I first talked to Ashley back uh, oh, several months ago, uh, she was very excited, and, and uh, as the, we've been getting closer and closer to this, she said, we're getting all kinds of calls. And I have to tell you that, um, and I've got to be very careful because this thing's being taped, and I, I, uh, some, of my, some of my throwaway lines I won't be able to use, <laughs> or, unless I can get with the guys in the editing room after we're done here. But um, one of my concerns was, she, was she said we're, we're, uh, we've got limited space and uh, it, it ended up that um, uh, she, she said at one point, she said, we've had probably 250 different requests and, uh, and uh, we're limited to 100. And I thought, please don't send anybody away. That was a very, very big concern of mine, uh, really. I didn't want anybody to show up and, and be denied access. And I said, you know, can't you squeeze some more seats in? and, and uh, and um, at people, you know, standing along the side, and she said, "Well, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, the fire marshal set the limit of that." And I, and I made a couple of facetious comments about the fact that, well, I'll, I'll work it out with the with the uh, with the authorities and and the fire chief and see if we can get an exclusion. And I shouldn't have said that. And now it's on tape. And uh, <laughs> what the heck? But. But anyway, I have to say that I had very, very real concern, and I was thinking, and it, it's, it doesn't matter now because it doesn't seem to be the issue, but I was very concerned and thinking about what would I do if there was, a, you know, a lot of people couldn't get in. And I thought I could probably write a letter to the, to the Speedway Press and, and just thank everybody who came and then, you know, show... Uh, so, you know, by, by, by regrets of the people that got turned away. And by golly, I think it's just about going to work out right. Because so. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to be uh, disappointed and, and uh, not to believe this too much further. But I got a call this morning from a guy in Chicago. And he said, I'm thinking of driving down. I said, please don't. <laughs> you might not be able to get in. And uh, so... We've, we've already had some discussion that we might do another one of these. But anyway, we've, um, uh, I, some of you may have already figured out or, or know the, uh, about uh, Mike Harmless, former mayor of Greencastle, who is my, my, my partner in this venture. And he does uh, all of the bookings and, and calls all the mayors around the state and says, hey, we're going to come and do an event in your town. You put it on and give us the date and we'll come. And uh, so uh, he, he's here tonight and um, I want to thank him for, for everything that he does. But a lot of the places that we go to, uh, a little further afield, um, so, you know, we, we'll do like, you know, rotary clubs in the northeast, south part of the state. And, and sometimes we've gone over the border a little bit. And so you think, well, I hope that uh, at least there's uh, a number of race fans because realizing that not everybody is. And if you go to, um, you know, uh, uh, Rotary or Kiwanis and it, it's, uh, you know, two and a half hours drive or something, you're going to have some people there that are race fans, but then you're also going to have some people where you are this week's speaker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're thinking, God, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, but but to, to, but this crowd here, um, I, I I recognize so many of you. I know so many of you. And I'm going to ask for a show of hands on this. How many people? Not not only do you go because I think that's that's going to be overwhelming. How many people in the room have or have had some involvement with the running of the race, either as an official or as a crew member or something? Could I a show of hands? I was thinking it might be more than that, but anyway, um, so I I, uh, I recognize so many of you, and so my question is going to be, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> what, what, 
it's, it's the same old, same old. So, uh, so bless you. Hopefully we can have a few laughs here. Uh, not as many as we might have if it wasn't being taped, but anyway, I'll have to, have to watch that. And uh, obviously, uh, it requires, I think, very little introduction for, uh, for this, uh, this audience tonight. So the greater part of it is going to uh, be Q&A. And uh, so uh, the aim is they, they, they would like for everybody to be out of here uh, at 8 o'clock. And so I'm going to start winding down probably 7 or a little after. I'll be doing Q&A for, for quite a while. And then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to you know, do one-on-ones with as many of you as I can. But they will be steadily steering us uh, out and into the, uh, into the foyer. And then they have to... Uh, uh, reset the room for, for events tomorrow. And uh, I, I guaranteed Ashley that we would be out of the parking lot by 11 o'clock. So we're going to do the best that we can. So, so anyway, uh, just uh, uh, I'll throw this out right up at the top. And this will sound like a joke, but it's real. When I asked um, uh, about how many of you have had an involvement, and I really thought it might be more, uh, how many of you are now or have ever been a yellow shirt? Oh, I thought it would be maybe way more than that. Well, boy, did we, we, all right, well, we've got some really hot contenders here. How many of you have ever thought that you might like to be a yellow shirt? <laughs> oh, come on, that's... <laughs> you, you, you would have to travel from Covington, uh, and uh, that's a little far. But I was thinking there's people here that can walk to the track. Well, uh, I, it sounds like a joke, but I'm quite serious. Uh, they are looking for able bodies to be yellow shirts. And uh, it's quite serious. We've got some information here. It's not an application per se, but really they're looking for not only the entire month for, for the road race, but uh, the other events, you know, SVRA, the, 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 uh, the vintage cars have come, and uh, uh, Brickyard 400 and, and the air races and, and everything. And uh, so uh, they, they need, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they need your assistance. And uh, uh, we, as we've been going around telling the stories in uh, a little further afield, uh, there, there are people that take a vacation from, and they live in California, and they come back and spend the month, and a number of you are nodding your head, so you know that the, this is true. Uh, they'll take a vacation and come back and spend the month here, or part of the month, to just be a yellow shirt. And so they can work out all kinds of things. I know that, that typically, you know, people say, well, I can do it, but uh, I can't work qualification days or the race. <laughs> and, uh, but they, but they, they work it out all, and, and, um, and I tell people, if it's the first time, you won't necessarily get the pits or the garage area the first time out, but you'll be on the ground somewhere. I mean, you won't be at Eastgate Shopping Center, uh, you know, loading buses and stuff like that. You'll be on the grounds. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if you don't get the garage area, I, I say that you've got the credentials, uh, you've got access, you can go wherever you want, and in fact, um, uh, you know, you can go back and, and schmooze with whoever you want to. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a little, this is a little um, uh, anecdote that, that some of you may know. Um, A.J. Foyt, for a number of years, drove for Anstead Thompson Racing, and that was Bill Anstead, and Shirley Murphy, and Shirley Murphy was a man. He was the Sheraton Hotels guy, and it's, it's amazing by how many people, with the assumption is that Shirley Murphy was, was a lady, it was a man. And a very prominent businessman, very prominent, very wealthy, uh, from Indianapolis, and he used to sign on to the safety patrol every year. And this goes back to way before the yellow shirts. It's when they had the, uh, the blue police outfits and the badge and the cap and, and the whistle. And he would register every year as on the safety patrol. 
And the reason that he did that was because he had better access than he did as a car owner. <laughs> and and uh, so you'll see him, sometimes he's in the victory lane shots and everything. And uh, so anyway, it, it's a lot of fun, there's a lot of camaraderie. Uh, I don't know what the house record is now. I don't know if there's anybody left who's done every year since the war, but not too long ago that was so. But I think you've got people there that have done it 40 and 50 years and, and uh, you know, 25 is, is not that unusual. So really, uh, long-winded uh, pitch here, but uh, we have some information that, um, uh, actually there, there, there's three sources and, and basically, uh, what, I, what as I found out the other day, and I'll reveal a little bit of myself here, I said, if, when I'm doing this talk uh, Wednesday night, tonight, uh, I said a number of them probably can, if, if we don't have any information ready to give them, shall I just tell them to go to the admin building? And, and uh, so what I was told, yes, uh, they, they have to register online and uh, so they, 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 they can go to the admin building. And I said, well, not everybody, some of them are like me. They, we live in the dark ages. We don't even know what going online means. <laughs> and so they, they said, no, well, that's okay. We'll take them in the back and sit them with somebody. So uh, seriously, if you have any interest at all, uh, Mayor Harmless will be up here when we're done and uh, we'll give the information, to, and, uh, but it's, it's a great experience. So I know that, that uh, although not as many of you put your hands up and said that you've been one as I had expected, surely you've got neighbors that have done it and uh, there's husband and wife teams. Um, it's not just for senior citizens. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this, it's not a volunteer position. It pays $8 an hour. <laughs> And uh, there, there's opportunities for college kids. So if you, if you know somebody that, that uh, is of, of college age, or I mean, uh, uh, I guess high school, uh, they'd still be in school. But anyway, it's, it's great opportunities, a lot of fun, and you can schmooze with Foyt and Kasha Nevers and, and, uh, and, and everybody else. So anyway, uh, I don't know that there's really too much to, uh, to say here other than uh, museums open every day, but Christmas Day and Thanksgiving. Uh, there's a new exhibit uh, going to be going in uh, that opens, uh, I think March 26th is the date or thereabouts, uh, which is a, a tribute to the Unser family. Uh, those of you that are regulars, you know, they've done Gurney and, and Parnelli and, and Penske and Foyt, and this one is about for the, uh, for the Unser family. And uh, we're doing talk of Gasoline Alley again. Uh, I think Monday, May the 6th is when we start. So we've still got the, that street going and uh, kind of had fun with that because I still call it WIBC, but it isn't. They moved that to the FM side a few years ago, and, uh, but it's still 1070. So we've been doing it, uh, and I'm dating myself here, every year since 1971, we've done what is now the talk of Gasoline Alley, and uh, the, the station's changed hands three times, and I think there's been like 12 program directors, but we're still there on 1070. And uh, it's not from six to seven anymore, and I, I miss that. I really, really enjoyed doing that out of the garage area, because we could have live guests on, and, and all the noise in the background with the impact wrenches and engines firing up, and. Chief mechanics, take your pop off out to the USAC office and <laughs> no smoking in the garage area. Yeah, right. So anyway, uh, we'll be doing that again. And, and so uh, uh, I'll entertain any questions that you may have with the usual disclaimers. And I think probably most of you in the room are, are aware of this. Um, I don't like controversy. I've always tried to steer clear of it. Uh, I haven't had very much success with that. But I've, I've worked, um, uh, I've actually had two jobs. Uh, uh, basically, I worked at the United States Auto Club and uh, then I, I left there in uh, 1997 and went to what was then Telex, which is now IMS Productions. And after 11 months there, then I, they, they sent me over to the museum as the historian. But uh, I, I would imagine the majority of you live in Speedway 
And I know that some of you are from, uh, you know, a little further afield, but I got thinking about this. I'm sure there have people that have um, lived in, I know there's people that have lived in Speedway for longer than I have, uh, but I, and I, I'm really dating myself now. I went to USAC in June of 1965, and since that time, other than for a brief period when I was in the, uh, when I was doing basic training, I have earned my living in Speedway. And uh, because I've only worked at two, basically two, two outfits. And so I wonder how many people could say that they've, they've earned their living since 1965 solely in Speedway, Indiana. So anyway, that's my little useless uh, uh, claim there. And now finally, by golly, after talking a bunch of rubbish for 15 minutes, Q and oh, I know, I was doing the disclaimers, that's right. So I, I, um, I, I didn't, um, I, I really don't like controversy, but you can't get rid of it, it's there. There's always something, and people say, oh, I remember this, or I remember that, or what was the year that, you know, this happened, and that, and I think, oh God, I don't wanna talk about that again. And uh, if you were, you know, at the event, and it was something that you witnessed, but if you work for the sanctioning body, or the racetrack, when everybody else goes home, that stays there, and the controversies never go away. So um, I'm, a, I'm not a gearhead. Uh, I'm about the participants, uh, meaning pretty much not only the drivers, but the chief mechanics and the car owners, but it, it goes back away. So uh, I have a hard time keeping up with current affairs. Um, my great interest is, is back uh, I still don't like rear engine cars, for heaven's sake. <laughs> no, that, that's not true. But um, really, by, uh, I, I, uh, I just, uh, I've been blessed to spend so much time here and become, uh, you know, friends with the, of the participants. And, uh, and uh, so many of my heroes have passed away now. That's getting, we're well, not getting, it's, it's depressing. But I'm in, in touch with so many family members and uh, what, a, what a, a thrill to have known these people. So, I like to tell stories about the people, and so let's uh, try some Q&A. Yes, sir. Uh, first off, Donald, let me um, thank you for all the years of, uh, of what you have thank provided you. in your part of thank the Speedway. You. It means the world to, uh, to me, and thank you're you. such an integral part of the uh, of the Speedway. And okay. It is kind of a kickoff getting to hear your show oh. at the beginning of May, and that's when we know that everything is getting oh. ready to happen. Well, thank you. Um, my first year here uh, as a kid was, I uh, was 10 years old, was 1967. Yes. And um, we never had an Is this a one. turban question? It's oh. going to go that way, <laughs> but, but I might take a different door to get there. But we're, so we're, when I, I won't make it controversial, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, as a kid coming here, uh, we, my family was not able to afford race day tickets. So qualifying for us was the event. That was May of yeah. us, and that's when my dad would bring us out here. On the turbot side, uh, we'll, we'll skip that year and we'll jump ahead to the three team of the uh, wedges, which really just made my, I just was so taken away by that. I always admired Andy Granatelli, but I was trying to remember, there was another car that was initially entered in, another number that didn't end up being used. I couldn't yes. remember who the driver was that wasn't able to make it and who subbed in a different number for him. If okay. it was Art Pollard or if it was Joe yep. Leonard who stepped in. Yep. Can you fill that void? All, all right, I'll, I'll just paraphrase for the, for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the, the taping here. Uh, the gentleman is asking about, uh, 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 it, it's basically, it's a turban question. And uh, I've had a lot of fun with, with Mayor Harmless where, um, where uh, I, I, I say I really don't care to talk about the turbans, which is not completely true, but, I, but sometimes I used to get the turbans coming and going and I thought, God, <laughs> would somebody ask about something else? But, but um, we've done a number of these and it almost always comes up and, and sometimes I'll say I don't like to do controversy and then the turban will be the first question. And then, if, if, and then sometimes not, I think we're getting through it and I've been facing this one for years. The worst thing that you can say is, 
Well, we're about out of time, but I think we've just got time for one more. Yeah, what was the, what, didn't they have jets out there and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so the gentleman is asking the question about the wedge turbines in 1968. And uh, uh, he, he's trying to, to, to trace the missing number. And actually, this is quite a story. Uh, the, the driver, uh, uh, the, 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 the driver's situation with the wedge turbines, and uh, there were four entered, and uh, they were 20, 30, 40, and 60, and, and 30 is, is the mystery one. But originally, uh, the lead driver of the wedge turbines in number 60 was to be Jim Clark, and uh, Clark was even here uh, well, actually, would come here several times, actually, when we kind of, people didn't even, you know, either they didn't know about Formula One or they, or they took it for granted. But, it, you know, Jim Clark tested here several times at very odd times. And in the spring of 1968, he came and drove the wedge and was here for like a couple of days. And uh, it was either the week or two weeks before he went to Hockenheim and, and had the, the fatal accident, and that's one of those things like a, you know, where were you when President Kennedy was shot and everything, and, and people remember where they were when they heard that uh, Jim Clark had lost his life. Personally, I learned it at Eldora Speedway, and Ralph Liguri came up to me and said, I was sorry to hear about your fellow countryman, and I didn't know what he meant, and I was, shocked because I thought Clark was, was forever. Anyway, he'd been here and tested and he was to be the lead driver. And then uh, uh, Graham Hill was now with the Lotus team and so he was in the second car and I'm not sure who else was nominated to begin with. However, a number of things happened. Uh, Clark was fatally injured and Mike Spence was brought in as, uh, as a replacement. And then also, the, the number 60 car was offered to Jackie Stewart. So talk about name dropping. So Jackie came to the track, but he couldn't pass the physical because he had a, he had a, 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 um, a cast on one of his wrists. He'd had an accident, uh, I think it was testing, but it was the, a connection with the Spanish Grand Prix. And it was just like a little hairline fracture. But anyway, he tried to, to, uh, to, to get the, to, to get the, uh, the, the well, he did the physical and they said, you know, sorry, we, we can't let you run. And so um, uh, Leroy Arbra came into the mix and uh, Pollard was a little bit later, but, uh, and I'm trying to think if I'm missing anybody else here, but I mean, there was all kinds of rumors. Oh, Parnelli, Parnelli was entered in the number, in the, uh, the 1967 number 40 car. And uh, if, did I get the numbers right? It, it was 20, 30, 60, and 70. And then 40 was the, the, was the, 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 uh, the Wushmobile with, with Parnelli. And Parnelli had decided uh, for a number of reasons, this is a way longer of an answer than you wanted, but he had decided that, the, that probably uh, the turbine didn't have a chance to win or as good a chance. And then also there were business considerations and he had kids and Firestone stores and, and, a, and he, a very, very smart cookie was Parnelli Jones. And so he decided to step aside. Uh, he, had a, he was a partner with Val Militic in a team and Joe Leonard was their lead driver. And obviously there was a Firestone connection but Leonard was then put into the wedge and then very quickly went, uh, you know, very quickly went quickly and, uh, and ended up winning the pole. But in the meantime, they had been devastated by, on May the 7th, um, oh, Greg Weld was in the mix too. Greg Weld was in car number 30. So 60 with uh, Clark gone and Stewart unable to, um, uh, Past the physical, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Stuart only able to pass the physical. I think I said that right. Uh, Mike Spence 
uh, who was uh, bounced back between BRM and, and Lotus and was almost like the number two, number three driver on, on the team. And then all of a sudden he's on Broadway because he's in the 60 car and running above the official track record. And uh, I, I think probably two or three days he was the fast time and, uh, and uh, just seemed to have the speedway figured out. Greg Weld in number 30 was having a bit of a struggle, evidently a handling problem. And so they asked Mike Spence to take out car number 30, which he didn't want to do, by the way, but they talked him into it. And so he went out and had this terrible accident. And I'm being probably way more graphic than I need to be, but I was actually in the pit lane when that accident took place. And I think it was like 10 to 6. And all of a sudden there was this boom, whatever, it was, like a, it was like a bomb going off. And it was the sound of the car hitting the first turn wall. It went straight in and then the sound went up and, and, and reverberated off the, the, you know, the, the roof of the double deck stands and it just sort of, people started running down there, but I'll never forget that, that boom. If you were to say, what was that? You'd never think, well, that was a race car crashing, but anyway, it was Spence. And so uh, they, they, he, he passed away that night, and it was exactly a month to the day after the, uh, the Clark passing. And uh, so uh, um, Chapman, Colin Chapman, was just devastated and laughed and said, I'm not coming back. Uh, you guys figure it out and carry on. So that's when Leonard came into the mix uh, to drive number 60, and then Graham Hill was very much of a team character builder, so he was sort of like the guy that stabilized everybody. And then uh, uh, the, th the 30 car w was destroyed. Now there's a little side story there. Greg Weld's wife, now in those days, they, they, uh, they had just started to do PA on practice days. And I don't know if that's what the, if anybody remembers that, but in 1966 and early, or, there was no PA on practice days. You were on your own. You sat up there with your stopwatch, and if you saw a crew jumping up and down, it meant they had a good lap, but there was, but there was nobody to tell you about it. And then 67 was the first year they did that. Well, anyway, when uh, uh, they, 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 they would, give the times of like three, four, five of the top people, but you know, the, the rank and file out there running wouldn't get mentioned. Greg Weld's wife had taken a walk and she was down in the first turn and saw the 30 car crash and thought it was Greg. So I don't know why I needed to throw that in, but you didn't get that off of Wikipedia. And uh, so, so anyway, uh, uh, so now they, they, you know, the, 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 the team set back again, and then um, there were a number of drivers, and then this, get, they're, they're, they're just throwing a little bit of color in here. Granatelli, A, wanted the drivers to, to experience what fun it was to drive the turbine, and then B, a number of the drivers were very curious anyway, and, and the, the, uh, the contracts were not quite as restrictive in those days. Bobby Unser was offered a ride by Granatelli. For, no, he'd driven for Granatelli, he drove the Novi, and uh, Bobby couldn't, and it was because he was on Goodyear and uh, the, the, the wedges were on Firestones. But Mario drove the turbine just to see what it was like. Lloyd Ruby drove the turbine just to see what it was like. And uh, my friend David Scoggins in the room, and I don't know, he could probably get me, uh, uh, think of some other people that may have been in that I'm not thinking about. But anyway, there was a, a game going on between Leroy Yarborough and Art Pollard. And Art Pollard was driving for um, Gerhardt, with Phil Casey, and I'm not sure how honest Pollard was being with, with his team. I think he wanted to drive the turbine. Anyway, he managed to talk his way into it and I remember that the, the qualifying line, Leroy Yarber was actually sitting in the car and whatever the discussion was, I don't know, but they actually took him out when he was probably fourth, fifth, sixth in line and then put Pollard in and then Pollard went ahead and, and, uh, 
and, and qualified the car. So uh, Leonard won the pole, um, Hill qualified second. Actually, Hill went out first and had the temporary pole and then Leonard moved him over. And then Pollard, I think, was back in like 11th or something like that. And, and uh, so uh, the race part, you know, you remember what happened, but um, I think that pretty much covers it. D David, if you're in the back there, did I miss any drivers in the, in the turbines? I think I got them all. Well, you didn't mention that Joe Leonard wadded up the uh, 67 car, and he and Pollard have both driven that in practice. He's uh, got a wedge. All right, well, he did. I, I, I knew that. I, did, I guess I didn't throw that out in this, this saga that's taken us to, to 6.30. But, but uh, Leonard was entered for Val Militich, and, uh, and then when he was, uh, and, and, and Parnelli Jones, and then when he was turned over to the, um, uh, the, the, the STP team, he drove the number 40 and crashed it. And then he, t he, took, uh, he took the wedge. And uh, this is another, I'm inserting myself into it, but I remember uh, I was walking through the garage area one day when it was kind of overcast. I don't think it was raining, but there was nothing much going on. And uh, it was the neat old uh, you know, green and white doors and everything, and a door opened and, and, and Parnelli just looked out as I was going by. And I waved and he waved me in. And so I said, uh, and, and this was after qualifying, and I said, I, I have to say I was really surprised because I thought you would get in the 60. He said, I was very close. <laughs> but he said, I decided not to do it, and he said, I wanted to, but he said, honestly, I'm just as happy to have Joe in the car. But um, so uh, it, it's really surprising that Parnelli didn't take it out for a run. But I can't. I don't think there was anybody else. But I know that 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 Mario and and uh, Ruby are trivia questions. And I'm I'm trying to. Th I don't remember if there was anybody else that that was um, in the mix that that didn't actually get in the car because the rumors were going crazy. But anyway, that's probably. Did I answer your question? You All right. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Any good Dan Gurney stories? Uh, actually, I just, uh, I, I, I wrote a few. Um, so this is probably, yes, I've got, I, I actually have got several and, and uh, it's kind of a rehash of some stuff I've written, but I had to cut them all short and tonight I don't have to, but so. Um, well, you know, Dan, it, it, it's just like he was made up by central casting, because he was a he was a tall, blonde, handsome Californian driving in Formula One. I mean, he most of the drivers, even back then, with the front engine cars, tended to be diminutive. Not all, but Gurney was tall, and he was an American, and he was in Europe driving for Ferrari. This is a corny movie script, right? <laughs> and uh, but. Um, he, uh, he won four Grand Prix, he drove for, for, uh, he drove for Ferrari in 59, and then Porsche in, in 60, oh, wait a minute, BRM in 60, Porsche in 61 and 62, and then 63 and 64 was Brabham. Anyway, uh, he won four Grand Prix, and uh, he was part of one of the most amazing eight-day periods in the history of, a, of from an American point of view. Um, Foyt wins the 567. Three weeks later, was it two weeks, two weeks later, I think, they're at Le Mans. And Foyt and Gurney share the winning Ford GT40 Mark IV and Foyt had never been there before or since, I don't think. <laughs> and so, and a, and a Ford, not Ferrari, a Ford won the 24 hours of Le Mans with Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt. And Foyt had just won the 500. So uh, that's from Saturday to Sunday. And uh, Gurney actually started, un unknowingly started a tradition. A lot of traditions happen by accident. And uh, it's, it's fairly well uh, accepted 
that the spraying of champagne from the podium and spraying all the press and the people standing in the front. Gurney at Le Mans in 67, which supposedly was the first person ever to do that, to, to shake it up and then do the squirt. Anyway, uh, exactly one week later, he wins the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps, which is a, a, a terrifying eight and a half mile road course, not one of these flat stadium things. This is down hills and over bridges and blind turns and long straightaways. And, uh, and, he, and it, it was a Westlake powered eagle. It was built in Santa Ana, California, and it wins a Grand Prix. When is this movie script gonna get real, you know? And uh, so uh, at the time, it got off a lot of attention but not as much as it may have later because, and I'm probably you know, preaching to the choir here, but, but back then, the American general public really didn't know about Grand Prix racing and road racing. That was the sporty car types that read road and track and had to wait three months to get the race sports and everything. <laughs> but uh, you know, typically a Grand Prix wouldn't even be a paragraph in the, in the sports section. But when, when uh, Le Mans was a pretty big deal, and then Gurney winning the Belgian Grand Prix, I mean, that was absolutely astonishing. But he'd almost won it a, a couple of times before that. In fact, maybe I, I might have an opportunity for an anecdote that I didn't have room for to, to put in the, uh, in the story uh, or some of the stuff that I've done. But uh, he was, um, as I say, very tall, uh, a little bit bashful, grinned a lot. And I always thought that it was astonishing that, that throughout the years that I was around, and, and even in the later years, the fact that he would blush. When people would pay him a compliment or some woman would give him a hug, he would, he would blush. I thought that was extraordinary. But, uh, and he was sort of the all-American boy, and car and driver had the, uh, uh, the campaign to have him run for president and all this stuff. But there was actually a, a mischievous side. Dan could be a naughty boy. And uh, he loved motorcycles. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, many times on the crew, AMA, what were then AMA Grand National Motorcycle Riders, would be on the crew. And uh, sometimes like three or four of them. They, uh, they would not only hang out at the shop, but they'd come and, and uh, you know, crew on, on race day. And uh, so there's this, this great story about uh, Dan was at a, a, a rental car with, with some friends. <clears throat> and the subject of the Moonshiners 180 on a bridge came up, which means that the, you know, the Moonshiners were, were well adapted at go, roaring down a county road. And if they saw the feds coming the other way, that they would be able to, uh, whatever they had to do was to perform a 180 on the access and go the other way. And uh, the, the, uh, the plumb line, if you like, for the, for the expert uh, Moonlight 180 was if you could do it on a bridge without hitting either side. <laughs> and uh, that, 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 was, that was a real expert. So Dan was laughing and, and said, I've always wondered how you do that. Somebody in the car knew how to do it and coached him. And apparently he took, had like seven or eight goes before he actually perfected it in this, uh, in the, in this rental car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's another one about Dan in a rental car in Europe that I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, but, but, so I'll move on from that. But um, oh, there, there was this um, uh, a topsy turvy finish at the Belgian Grand Prix in 1965. Uh, 60, no, 64? 64. No. Either 64 or 65, it doesn't matter. So Dan um, was driving for Brabham, and they didn't do pit stops in those days unless there was a problem. Pretty, you know, it was usually flag to flag. And uh, the, the speed was so great that the fuel consumption was such that he ran low on fuel. And I think it was with two laps to go, and I don't remember how many laps the Grand Prix was because it was an eight and a half mile lap. 
And so Dan came in and, uh, and they'd already started to pack the fuel up and, and take it away. And so he's thinking, mm, 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 mm. and he thought, I'll go out. And th this was an ass told to. I broke, broke this story for Auto Week. And so you know, I had Dan telling me the story. He said, I decided to go out and see if I could get another lap in while they got ready. And he said, so I went out and he said, I ran out of fuel. Well, in the meantime, and I haven't thought about this for quite a while, uh, into the, uh, Jim Clark had led early, but had made a lengthy pit stop and was racing to catch up. So, um, Graham Hill took the lead with the BRM. I think this is how it worked out. And in second place was uh, Bruce McLaren. I may have it backwards. Anyway, uh, Hill was, 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 was on the, uh, the back side, but, not, you know, but more than halfway around. And uh, I think the battery packed up. And so he was going slower and slower and slower. And then McLaren went by, but it might have been the other way around. <laughs> anyway, one of them was stopped at the side of the track. And then the other one was slowing down and coming around the top of the, um, uh, of the, the, of the final turn to go down the hill. And so once you got down the hill, then you could pick up speed, supposedly. So I'm, I'm telling this, this terrible story here. It might have been McLaren had the problem and then Hill went by and then he was having a problem. And so anyway, the, uh, the starter was waiting for Hill in the BRM. And a BRM comes flashing down and they give him the checkered flag, but it was Richie Ginther in the other BRM. And uh, here comes, um, uh, then here comes McLaren, I think, rolling down the hill, trying to get to the checker. And then all of a sudden, I, I think everybody missed it. Clark went roaring by and won the race. But, but they didn't know that at the time because he had, they, didn't, they don't do white flags over there. But if they had, he was running fourth. And so anyway, um, Gurney, oh, I, Gurney had, had run out of fuel way out in the, in the forest and uh, part of the Ardennes forest, which uh, you can read about with, with World War II activity. And he said, I'm just standing there. And then he said, uh, um, it, it got quiet and I can, he said there was no PAs in that area. So I, you know, I don't know what's going on. And then he said, uh, off in the distance, I see a car coming very, very slowly, and it's Clark. He's out of fuel. Yeah. And he rolls to a stop, and I'm not making this up. I mean, it's been photographed by Jeffrey Goddard for Road and Track. Great, wonderful series of photographs where this guy was out in the toolies instead of the obvious places and got all these fabulous shots. So Clark pulls up, and it, it was 64 because they'd been teammates at Indianapolis. And uh, so, you know, hey, hi, Dan, what are you doing here? Well, I ran out of fuel. Well, I ran out of fuel. Oh, who won the race? I don't know. So anyway, they're, they're, they're talking amongst themselves. And, uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight minutes goes by. And then they hear a race car off in the distance. And it pulls up, and it was um, Peter Arundel in the other Lotus. And he said, hey, come on, they're looking for you, to Clark. And Clark said, what, what, what happened? He said, you won the race, come on, they're waiting for you. <laughs> and so Clark has this wonderful, incredulous look on his face, and he climbs on the back and, uh, and, and actually rode piggyback on the engine cover so that, that uh, I'm sure it was Peter Arundel, could, could deliver him at the, the foot of the, what used to be the podium, which was not nearly as grandiose as it is now. And it was, I tr I'm trying to think of the other combinations because several people ran out of fuel. And uh, I know there was one driver came in with two people piggybacking. 
But uh, anyway, so that is sort of kind of a Dan Gurney story, but not really. But anyway, forgive me for that one. Um, probably the... Uh, oh, he was the first person to wear a full-face helmet. And I, I had never seen one before, and it was never used in practice to the best of my knowledge. I just remember that on race morning, and I see some nodding heads here, race morning, I remember looking down and thinking, what the hell is that? <laughs> and it looked so weird at the time. And he finished second, and that was the first time I think a lot of people had ever seen a full-face helmet. Uh, so there's others, but uh, oh golly, he won the Riverside Five. I had a lot of fun with this one. Trivia question. I've said, can you name, this years ago, and it's kind of gone by the wayside now, but I said, can you name a driver that won a 500-mile NASCAR race in five out of six years, including four in a row? Well, you know, Kelly Arbor, Darrell Waltrip, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it's Gurney, won Riverside, and, and so it, 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 to me that was a great <laughs> trivia question because when you say NASCAR, you're not thinking a road course. But Gurney won the Riverside 500 in, in um, you know, uh, uh, 63, 4, 5, 6, missed 67, Parnelli won that, and then 68, he came back and, and won it again. But anyway, the, probably the, the most, uh, I don't know if poignant would be the term, but when, when Jim Clark passed away and everybody went to Scotland for the funeral, and, and I'm sure a number of you know this, uh, Gurney was, was standing with a bunch of drivers and an older gentleman came up and asked Dan if he could speak to him alone. And he led him away and took him into a, in, in a study and it was Jim Clark's dad. And he said, I, I wanted to know, he said, we didn't see much of Jimmy in recent years because of the tax situation. He moved to the south of France. So, so we don't see him that much. But he said, whenever we've spent time with him and he's talked about the other drivers, he said, I wanted you to know that he said that the driver that he feared most as a competitor was you. And Dan just about lost it. And, and, uh, and he, you know, he almost weeps or would weep every time it would come up. But I thought, well, you know, we, we, there could be no finer tribute, could there? You know, I mean, we're talking Stewart and Brabham and, and, uh, and you know, all the other fellows that were running at the time. And that, 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 that uh, although success doesn't show because he just had the four Grand Prix, that according to the dad, that, that Dan was the one that Clark feared the most as a competitor. So... Well, we had three questions, I think, so far, and it's quarter to seven. <laughs> All right. Um, yes? Uh, two topics, if you could touch on each. My father worked on the 1965-66 Jerry Altman Ford Lotus driven by Al Miller, and he told me his stories about it. I was wondering if you had any anecdotes about that scene. Okay, he said his dad worked on the, uh, uh, in, in, did you say 65 and 66? Yes. For, for um, the, the, uh, the Lotus that, that uh, Al Miller drove, which was the Jerry Alderman Ford sales special, <laughs> and Carol Horton was the chief mechanic. Um, not, I, I don't think uh, really, except that I think it was a surprise, because Al Miller was sort of an old school, uh, uh, you know, manhandle front engine sprint cars, and, and uh, you know, make them, go, make them go even if they don't want to kind of a thing. And uh, the thinking was that the rear engine cars required more finesse, and Al Miller was not known as a, as, as a, as a sort of a road racing type rear engine guy, a big man. I mean, you know, World War II veteran that, that was decorated, but I mean, a big man with huge hands. And yet he seemed to be able to get the, the Lotus around. I think he qualified seventh and then finished fourth in the race. And uh, it was, um, and I, th I think, uh, I'm trying to think, because there, there, there was a battle going on between Al Miller in the rear engine Lotus and Gordon Johncock in the Weinberger Roadster. Uh, and I think they were like back and forth, fourth and fifth. And it seems to me that Miller had to make, th th there was no, uh, uh, let's see, 
They did have a minimum number of pit stops. That was the first year for minimum number of pit stops, which was two. And it seems to me that Miller may have had like four or even five, and don't quote me on that, but it seems to me that his, the fuel consumption was high enough that he had to you know, make extra stops. But it was his best finish, and uh, I think probably rather a surprise, because if you were looking, and I hope nobody take this wrong, but uh, you know, Al Krulak uh, was his real name, was not somebody that I think on race morning, when you looked and saw that there were now 12, uh, no, more than that, there was 27 rear engine cars and roadsters, and if you looked at all the people that were running the, the rear engine cars, which was Clark and Parnelli and Foyt and uh, Mario, I don't know that anybody on race morning would have said, Al Miller's gonna finish fourth. <laughs> so that's probably about all I have, I think. The other topic was, uh, with today being the last day of Black History Month, if you could talk to Charlie Wiggins and his involvement at Motor Speedway. Um, I, 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 fortunately, they couldn't hear that. I, I would rather pass on that one for a number of reasons for right now. Okay. <laughs> I, w I would do it privately, but not in front of a group, okay? And now everybody's going to say, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Could you tell us just a little bit about Tucker's special that's on the museum right now? Because when it first arranged, it was qualified for the 500. Uh, somebody will have to relay that to me, please. Oh, oh, the Preston Tucker sponsored car? Oh, yes, okay, the, the, um, the, the question is he wants, the, there, there's a car that is part of the museum collection which is, has the Preston Tucker name on the side. Uh, that was, there's, there's uh, it was an early rear engine car, and uh, this is based on something else I've written just recently. Um, the rear engine revolution, uh, in a lot of people's mind, Jack Brabham, in 1961 with the Cooper was the first rear engine car ever at the Indianapolis Speedway. Not so. Uh, rear engine cars were entered every year and were at the track every year from 1937 to 1951, and minus, of course, the war years, but only four ever qualified. And the car that is, is part of the museum collection is one of three that were built, uh, sponsored by Gulf, designed by Harry Miller, and I've got to try and remember all of that. They, they were uh, rear-engined, slant six, supercharged, and they ran on gasoline, four-wheel drive. And uh, George Bailey, and I'm not sure which one this is because there were three, they didn't have much luck. Uh, George Bailey uh, qualified outside of the second row in 1939 and uh, was out after 47 laps, which was the greatest distance completed by a rear engine car until Brabham uh, you know, did the 200 in 1961. But uh, they had a problem the, the, uh, the first two years, uh, I, I, well actually, in, in 38, two were entered, only one arrived. And it was too late to qualify. Ralph Hatburn showed up to make a qualifying attempt when they just shut qualifying down. In 39, there were three of them. And uh, their main downfall was that they had pontoon tanks, no fuel cells, and gasoline. And so if one of the tanks got punctured, it wasn't a pretty picture. And uh, so uh, uh, two, uh, um, one driver was seriously burned and then Bailey lost his life. Uh, God, I don't want to do all this stuff. <laughs> they, they took the pontoons off and so in 1941, uh, or, or, yeah, in 1941 they appeared without them. There were two that qualified for the race and only one started because uh, the, the, that was Al Miller, the, the original Al Miller, whose name was Al Miller. And then the other one was George Barringer, and uh, poor George Barringer's car was in a fire on race morning and, and couldn't stir it. 
Anyway, uh, one of the cars eventually became turned over to George Barringer and he ran it in 46 and it was called the Tucker Torpedo Special. And, uh, but it would, uh, uh, Preston Tucker had nothing to do with the car other than sponsor. That, that was all there was to it. But a number of people in racing actually worked for Preston Tucker on, that, uh, on, on the Tucker automobile. And I'll back up to try and throw a little color in here as I'm, I'm beginning to run out of time. Uh, Preston Tucker actually lived in Indianapolis for a short time. And I actually was at Noblesville, but uh, he was the, the, uh, like the general manager or sales manager for a Packard dealership on North Meridian. And he lived at the Athletic Club circa 1938. Anyway, so um, he, he comes back after the war. And uh, so the, 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 the Tucker specials that appear, the one that you're referring to, were, was, a, was strictly a sponsorship. There was nothing Tucker about it. Uh, so anyway, uh, George Barringer drove it in 46, and then Al Miller drove it in 47, and it was still around as late as 1951. But at some point in 1950, we think, Frank Briscoe had the car, and he changed it from four-wheel drive to front drive. And I'm not too sure right now that it isn't a front drive car rather than a four wheel drive. So I don't know if that's much of an answer for you. So let's try and uh, pick up the pace here a little bit, Donald. And uh, if, if, because I, I feel that I've, I've short sheeted some of you. Let's, let's do some quick ones if we can. Yes? This will be a quick one. Um, I grew up on 16th Street. What is your earliest memory of that neighborhood housing? mechanics, drivers, the way they used to line up on 16th Street. My, what, year my, did, what year did you move into that neighborhood? Um, well, I was, I was here for the greater part of three weeks in 1964. Okay. And, uh, but uh, when I, I came back to live, I actually lived up on Redbird Drive. I, w I, I, I was in and out of Speedway because I couldn't afford a house yet. Uh, I, I, I rented a place, uh, rented a room, and, and, uh, or actually a couple of rooms, and wherever I was was close enough that I could walk to the track. So I was on Redbird Drive, uh, I was at uh, uh, 16th and Auburn, and then um, uh, uh, Eagledale Drive, North Berwick. And I do remember that when I was on North Berwick uh, in 1971, WIBC had, had kind of gone, this is more radio stuff than anything, uh, WIBC was not always number one in town. It had been, but it had gone into a, a slide uh, circa 67, 68, 69, and it was an effort to bring it back, which was successful. And in 1971, they said, we're going, that by that time they had Chuck Riley, Gary Todd, Orly Knudsen, and, and all the big guns, and uh, Sid Collins, and they said, we're going to go out there and just cover this like it's never been done before. So some of you probably remember the, uh, the magic ticket, 30 days in May, the impossible contest, and all of this. And uh, that's actually how the talk of Gassing Alley got revived. Anyway, one of the things was they said, we're going to do qualifying wall to wall, and we're going to go on the air at six o'clock in the morning is when we're going to start. And we'll do fans in the stands and all of that kind of stuff until practice starts, and then we'll turn it over to Lou, and, and, and so I was part of that. Well, the reason for bringing all of that up was that I was living on North Berwick. No, not true. Um, that would be, it would have to be 72. But I, I moved into the house in, in November of 71. Yeah, so anyway, on this morning, I had to get up very early because I'm going to walk to the track, and the gates opened at 6, but I needed to be at the track by 6. And so I'm probably coming out the front door and, and walking down North Berwick at, at probably 5.30. And I remember that when I, and this was the first qualifying day, 
when I got to 16th Street, and we, we lived at 1724, so it wasn't a very long walk, but when I got to 16th Street, there was traffic backed up as far as you could see. And so I make the right turn to head towards the track and, and uh, the underpass or overpass or whatever you want to call it. And there are two deep cars with people asleep in the cars back as far as you could see for qualifying. So I do remember, you know, that very, uh, uh, very vividly and, and uh, so many other members of 16th Street. I mean, the thing that, one of the things that really amazed me was when I first arrived downtown on a Greyhound bus and uh, to come out to the track and uh, people were very helpful in telling me what, you know, where you get on the bus and, and uh, the bus stops were outside G.C. Murphy. Remember that on North Illinois? <laughs> and But there's several stops. I thought, gee, which one do you get? And everybody was so helpful. And so I sang to the driver, and, 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 and uh, people on the bus were talking to me. And I said, would you please let me know when we get to the stop where you have to get off to go to the track? Because as much as I thought I knew about it, it never occurred to me that it would be as accessible because I, you know, when I would go to Wembley Stadium in London, when you got off at Wembley, you weren't at Wembley Stadium yet. It was way off of the distance and you had to trudge up the hill to get there. And so I imagine that the racetrack was in the middle of sort of like a park and that you get off and then trudge for a while before you get there. And so, gee, I hope I don't miss it. I hope I don't miss it. I hope I don't miss it. Coming out 16th Street, White front, I didn't know what that was yet. <laughs> and uh, down through the underpass, and the grandstands are hanging over you. And I couldn't believe that you pull up on the corner with the single story brick that I had been looking at photographs and in Floyd Clymer's yearbook for years, and it was right there. I was astonished at how close everything was. But as far as 16th Street and just Speedway in general back then, it was so neat because that was the tail end of, of um, or, or, or the, the winding up of, of drivers actually living in Speedway or renting. And uh, some just came in for the 500 only, and, uh, and then others that were, you know, driving sprints and midgets would come in and, and spend the greater part of the summer. So they would sort of come back about mid-March and, and uh, you know, be in a basement or something like that. And, uh, and then uh, right before race time, the wife would come in with the kids that were in school. And uh, some of them didn't like that. I remember Len Sutton's daughter told me, she said, I didn't want to leave school. So she would stay with an aunt in Portland, Oregon for like another three weeks or whatever it was before uh, she would come back. But um, all summer long, I mean, the, there, were, there were drivers that actually drove race cars for a living. You know, they didn't own all the businesses. They were carpenters and, you know, Macareth and, and uh, Joe Saldana were bricklayers. And, and, uh, and so they, they, they drove race cars and their living was 40% of the prize money, whatever that was. And if they went to a sprint race and, and broke down in practice, no money. And so they, during the week, they're waiting for the next race. And they used to come in the USAC office and, and that was, what a, you know, what a, a magical time it was. I mean, USAC is sort of a completely different organization, but times have changed, and, and that certainly has. But I'd be in the office there, working for Henry Banks, and here comes Rutherford, would come in, you know, two, three times a week, and Carl Williams, and Gary Congdon, and Ronnie Dooman, and Gene Hartley, and Bobby Grimm, and, uh, and, and uh, you'd, you'd walk down, uh, walk down Main Street, and there was Smitty's Barber Shop, and here's Ruby getting a haircut or somebody. And then the uh, Rosners had a lunch stand, but just with the stools. But if you went down to where Dawson's is, that had been the original Beck's drugstore, and now it was. And there, there's a little uh, trivia there. Um, are I trying to get into this? Uh, that, that, that was actually, the Rossner family had the back drugstore, drug and there was sort of like a disagreement within the family, and so some of them left 
to open another drugstore down the road, but they couldn't call it Rossner's because there was already one. And so Beck was a family name, and I don't think any member of the Beck, Beck family was a pharmacist. But anyway, so that, that was, there was the pharmacy there, but there was the lunch counter where you had booths and you could sit and, and uh, you know, with your feet on the floor. And, and I remember like a tire test time or like right before Springfield Milwaukee weekend, there'd be Foyt, Rutherford, uh, Judd Larson, Mario in a Dean Van Lines t-shirt and, you know, Tinklestad and, and all these people, Ruby, McCluskey, it was just a magical time. And then uh, when it got to be, you know, the Hoosier 100 and, and Terre Haute Hut 100, and then a lot of them would then, you know, pack up and, and then go home for the winter. But uh, just, just living in Speedway was just, a, just an exciting, exciting time. And uh, got some anecdotes there, but uh, oh golly. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, but God, Thursday night at the White Front, that was movie night. And uh, they, they, there was, uh, they'd set up a 16 millimeter projector at around six o'clock on Thursday. They had to be, they'd, they'd pack up about 8.30 because the, the live music started at nine. Go on the White Front and uh, here's uh, everybody, you know, Chuck Rohde, Derman, Grimm, Herdebees, Tinglestad, you know, the, and they'd be running racing movies and, and uh, the people in the movies were in the audience. <laughs> and they'd be, you know, you know the, one of them would crash in the movie and there'd be a big cheer go up and then all this stuff, <laughs> a lot of rats. Oh, Watson, uh, Clint Bronner, uh, Billy DeVore, uh, uh, Judd Larson, uh, Greg Weld, who actually didn't drink, he drank Cokes. I remember one night when, when the door opened and Al Lenser and Art Pollard came in and they'd been giving a talk. And I'll never forget when those two came in, I mean, young Al Lenser was a good looking bloke. And he had a, they both had gray suits, white shirts and a red tie. And when they came in, God, it was, I'll never forget that. And then some of the others were, uh, I, I missed Jimmy Bryan, that's before my time. But apparently when Bryan would come into the white front, it was like Jack Palance coming into the, 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 the thing in, in, um, in Shane. I mean, <laughs> did, did you ever notice, as an aside, did you notice that when Mario would come in to a room, sometimes by himself, he would stand there and sometimes he would have a, a jacket with the collar turned up. And when he would, he, would, he would stand with his hands almost as though they were hovering over the holsters. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> I don't know what the, the image, forgive me. <laughs> God, I love this group. This is, this is great, <laughs> love you all. But um, anyway, just a, it was just a magical time because it wasn't long before uh, the, the, the nature of the race driver b began to change and, and uh, you know, then they would, they would uh, you know, live in Carmel or, or a, you know, even if they had a local presence, but, but them just sort of being around Speedway and coming into the office to kill time until the next race, <laughs> golly, those, those were just wonderful, wonderful times. Um, all right, let's try another quick one, and then we will, we will try to wind up. Uh, there's all the way in the back. I'm a librarian, so I'm really curious to hear about your favorite racing books. My favorite racing book? Uh, boy, that's a, that's, that's a toughie. No, I, I, I couldn't pick out one. I mean, there have been some some were, were, that have done well that were disappointments, and there were some that were excellent, but I, no, that would be very hard for me to pick out one. Sorry. Shortest answer I've ever given. All right, so, yes, sir. Big question. Why were you drawn to the Indy 500 when you were in Britain? Why was I drawn to the Indy 500? Oh, I, I, there's not an easy answer to that. I was and I was drawn to Formula One at the time, so I kind of understand I couldn't give you a short answer on that one, but there was just something. When I first saw the name and, and, and then uh, saw the names, 
I, I, I remember being fascinated because I, I was raised on Grand Prix racing. So we had Sterling Moss and Mike Hawthorne, but we had Juan Manuel Fangio and Luigi Valeresi and, and, and you know, classical names like that. And I was fascinated that um, th a lot of the Indianapolis drivers had a foreign sounding surname with a, with a, a common first name like mm. Bill Vukovic. Mike Nazareth, and I was fascinated by that. But I think that, that um, and, and in short order of being fascinated by the names and how appealing they were on paper, and then seeing the photographs of the cars and how beautifully they, they were turned out. And I know that they, they really turned heads when they went to Monza in 1957 and 58 when I was first getting into it. And uh, these glorious, beautifully painted cars, you know, the Watson Roadsters and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the pinstriping and, and the, the, you know, the, the crew had their name lettered on the side, everything that was so beautifully turned out. And I remember that the European journalists were, were very impressed with the fact that they said, that, you know, the car's sitting there and it's not five minutes before one of the crew will take out a rag and just wipe it and it's just so shiny. So I think it was the, the, the appearance of the cars, the car names, and then uh, the, the names of the drivers. And uh, so I just thought, I've got to go. So it, it wasn't a whim. I saved up the money for seven years to, to finally make the trip. And and what, and this, this is just, I've, I've probably a number of you have heard me say this so many times. What I never expected and I was totally bowled over by was how friendly the drivers were. I just, I was astonished. And many of you have experienced that, um, that I just figured they would be tough guys. I just figured that, you know, don't mess with Jim Rathman because he'll, you know, Maury Rose or, you know, whoever it is, but Bill Cheeseburg, ferocious looking beast, Jack Turner, nicest guy, Len Sutton. Bob Christie, Jimmy Daywalt, Bobby Marshman, they were just lovely people. And I was amazed at that. And, and uh, you know, Parnelli was extremely friendly. And, and then I met Duke Nalon, and, and uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I don't want to miss anybody out. But that was probably the biggest surprise. What a joy it was that almost all, some were a little, I mean, Roger Ward, had a bit of an edge. I mean, he bent the sunglasses and the, yeah, kid, in 64. <laughs> but, but it wasn't, you know, over a period of years that changed and, and uh, he became one of the people I most enjoyed spending time with because he had such wonderful stories, a, t a terrific source. But I found that, uh, and uh, maybe some of you have too, if you had time to hang around with it. Almost every race driver I think I've ever met was a really nice person, including the Formula One people, not all, but many of them, the NASCARs, uh, drag racers, motorcycle racers, and, and uh, you know, all of the USAC people, just very, very down to earth. And I was just am amazed at how friendly most of them were. So I don't know if I'm really a happy ending on that note, but I did say that I would try to wind it up a little after seven. And so all I can say is, um, by golly, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I, I didn't get to all of you. Uh, I hope that this was somewhere close to what you wanted and it sort of kind of kicks off our season. We're gonna be doing a bunch of these in, in the next few weeks and we've already talked about doing another one, possibly on, uh, was it Tuesday, May the 2nd? I think we were looking at Wednesday. Okay, that's a tentative, that came up tonight. And so again, Thank you for coming, and I'm so, I can't tell you how relieved I am that we just had perfect capacity here and I don't think anybody got turned away. So that's fantastic. Thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, if, if you, if you give any consideration at all to being a yellow shirt, by yellow golly, shirt. they need you and that's serious. Right.